This week's episode of Discovering Trek is brought to you exclusively by our friends at Fansets. Keep listening for this week's special discount code just for Discovering Trek listeners. Discover a whole new universe of pin collectibles with Fansets online at fansets.com. Our first real away mission on Discovery, a Klingon defection? And, uh uh-oh, Stamets' side effects are starting to show. Well, those are just a few things that piqued my interest in Episode 8 of Star Trek Discovery. It is now official canon, and it's time to talk about what we witnessed in all of its harmonious glory. I'm your host, Dan Davidson, and we are Discovering Trek. Welcome one and all to Episode 8 of Discovering Trek, the Star Trek Discovery Companion, presented by Fansets. It is great to be here with you once again to talk about the latest episode of Discovery as we prepare for the fall finale in just one week's time. Again, my name is Dan Davidson, and we are just thrilled that you are joining us here today. As always, this is the premier podcast to get the most in-depth discussion and analysis about the latest episode of Star Trek Discovery, entitled Siwis Pacem Parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. It had a lot going on in a lot of different places, and we're going to dissect it all right here. And in addition to our signature episode analysis, we'll get our thoughts as to what we think might happen next, and more importantly, we'll discuss what this week's episode helped us discover about our own humanity. And you know, as always, there is only peace and harmony on this podcast when I can do it with a very special person who I'd like to introduce to you right now. He's my very special friend, my brother in Trek, and my amazingly talented co-host, Bill Smith. Bill, peace and tranquility. I was just going to say the same thing to you, peace and tranquility. Dan, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk about this this next to last episode before the winter break, and uh, it's going to be a great time. It is going to be a great time. There was a lot going on in last night's episode, a lot to take in, a lot to digest, and we're going to do all of that right here uh, on the podcast, and we're going to have a special guest joining us this week. Of course, last week with the storm up in the Northeast, it was you and I solo, Uh, but this week we've got a special friend with us, don't we? We sure do, Dan. Joining us tonight is one of our favorite podcasters and one of our favorite people. We were recently guests on his Star Trek Enterprise podcast, Warp 5, over at Trek FM. And he's also the co-host of that network's dedicated podcast for Star Trek Discovery called The Edge. He's our great friend, Brandon Shea Mutala. And Bishay, welcome to Discovering Trek. Thanks so much, gentlemen. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm a longtime listener, first-time caller. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, it's great to have you over here. Of course, uh, we've talked to you before over on Trek Geeks, my man. And uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, to talk about this latest episode eight. Uh, but before we dive into it, Bill, uh, would you be kind enough to remind our listeners just how they can contact us to share their thoughts on this week's episode? Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Absolutely, Dan. Those hailing frequencies are open, and people can find us on Twitter at Discovering Trek, and on Facebook or the Book of Faces. We can be found at facebook.com slash Discovering Trek. There you can join in on the discussion, leave us some comments, questions, suggestions, talk about what you thought of the episode, and um, all that great stuff. Of course, don't forget, you can send us a voicemail. Let your voice be heard at speakpipe.com slash trekgeeks. And please remember, any comments you may leave us could be used in an upcoming episode of Discovering Trek. Dan? Thank you, sir. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. From here on in, this episode of Discovering Trek contains spoilers. So if you haven't watched Episode 8 of Star Trek Discovery, stop listening right now. No, really, stop listening. Go on over to CBS All Access and watch the latest episode. Failure to do that puts you at risk to find out plot developments and character details for Siwi's Pacem Parabellum. (laughs) 
the Discovery jumps in to rescue the USS Gagarin from attack by six Klingon vessels, and it looks like all these Klingon ships can cloak now. The Discovery makes it a fight and takes some real damage to help spare the Gagarin, but they're unable to save the Starfleet vessel and her crew. Lorca tells his bridge crew that now isn't the time to grieve, and Discovery goes to black alert and jumps away. Lieutenant Stamets exits the reaction cube after having made the jump. He refers to Tilly as Captain, and then becomes really defensive and irritable when he realizes what he said. Captain Lorca chats with Admiral Tyrrell. Tyrrell explains that Cole of House Corps has gotten the Klingon ship of the dead operational again and is giving the invisibility screen technology to any Klingon house that swears fealty to him. Burnham is on an away mission with Saru and Tyler. They're on the planet Pavo, a world where every organic object vibrates with a kind of song. Starfleet hopes to use those vibrations in concert with a giant natural spire that the planet has to create a kind of sonar that's capable to find cloaked Klingon ships. The problem for Saru is that the constant noise of the planet is like torture to his enhanced senses. The landing party encounters what looks like floating lights in the air, and they seem to be a sentient life form. Saru notes that Pavo is supposed to be uninhabited. Burnham says that the being isn't registering as a life form and that it appears to be part of the planet itself. The life forms want the landing party to go one way, and their mission wants them to go the other. It becomes increasingly apparent that they should follow the glowy people. Laurel beams into the sarcophagus ship for a chat with Call. Call reminds her that he's not Takuvma. Cole seeks to rule, not to unify. Laurel swishes to swear her allegiance to Cole for her house. She also wants to use her interrogation skills to get information out of Cole's prisoner, Admiral Cornwell. Cole wants useful information. Back on Pavo, the landing party has followed the life forms to a hut with crystals inside of it. The universal translator isn't working, and Saru tries to make contact. Physically. Kind of. It's really disorienting, but Saru understands their intent. The landing party begins to follow first contact protocols, since this no longer is about general order number one. Laurel enters Admiral Cornwell's cell and tells her to scream. She resists at first, but then they scream at each other, convincing the guard outside to walk away, and this gives the two of them a little chance to chat. Burnham and Tyler discuss what they might do once the war is over. Burnham knows that she'll have to finish her life sentence out, and Tyler suggests, well, maybe they should just not let the war end. That seems prudent. They share their first kiss in a non explodey kind of way. Aw. Tilly finds Stamets in the mess hall and asks him what's going on. Stamets admits that something has been happening to him. He can't tell Dr. Culber because it would require Culber to report him, and then Stamets would be sent to a lab for examination. If he does tell him, and Culber doesn't take action, it could mean the end of Culber's career. Tilly offers to help keep an eye on Stamets. Laurel asks Cornwell what the Federation does with their prisoners of war. When Cornwell says they don't have a death penalty, Laurel tells her that she wants to defect. Okay. She offers to help Cornwell escape in exchange for safe passage. Saru's conversation with the Pavo consciousness is going very slowly. He says the organism is the planet. The natural transmitter there is Pavo's attempt to make themselves known and to make contact with others. The landing party rests inside the hut. The noise of the planet awakens Saru. He goes outside and asks the life forms to just make the noises stop. They make contact with him, physically again, or however the glowy cloud people make contact these days. In the morning, Saru seems rested and says he's made contact with Captain Lorca and updated him. He then takes Burnham and Tyler's communicators and crushes them in his hands. He tells them they will now stay on Pavo and live in harmony uh, forever. Saru leaves to tell the life forms that they've accepted their offer. Realizing Saru is now compromised, Burnham and Tyler disagree on how to proceed. Tyler pulls rank and determines they'll take what they need from the Povins. Laurel and Cornwell make their way to Laurel's ship, and they are discovered by call. Laurel and Cornwell fight. Laurel slams the Admiral against some sort of device seemingly electrocuting her, 
and killing her. Saru chats with Tyler. Saru says he believes he himself was the problem before when the planet was making too much noise. He was not at harmony. Tyler believes Saru was fighting something and then decided to stop. Something Tyler just doesn't know how to do. Tyler wants to make the Klingon suffer the way they made him suffer. Saru shows Tyler a crystal rock of some kind that the Povins gave him. Tyler touches it and it glows. And then he pulls away really suddenly. Saru realizes that Tyler has been lying and distracting him while Burnham is off somewhere else. Speaking of Burnham, she arrives at the transmitter spire. She begins setting up equipment to connect to it. Saru sprints toward her, making use of his fast Kelpian speed. Laurel drags what's left of Cornwell into a room with a sarcophagus. She finds dead Klingons and their people she knows. Klingons loyal to Takuvma. She's determined to end Cole no matter what. Although she does leave Cornwell's body with the others. Burnham tries to make contact with the Discovery when Saru arrives and begins smashing her equipment. They fight. Saru continues to just beat on the equipment, trying to end the transmission, and Burnham grabs her phaser and attempts to stun Saru. Burnham tells Saru that they can't have the peace he seeks until the war with the Klingons is over. The Pavans teleport Tyler to the transmitter. Sulu apologizes to the creatures. Burnham appeals to the Pavan, saying that together they can end the war with the Klingons and bring harmony. Saru worries that the Klingons will hurt the Pavans if they find out. Well, then the Pavans activate the transmitter, the Discovery makes contact, and then beams the landing party back aboard the Discovery. Tyler and Saru were brought to sickbay. Burnham talks to Saru. He admits that he lied to her and attacked her and nearly killed her. She says, you know, he wasn't himself. But the problem is that Saru says he was. Fear is how Kelpians survive, and he's never known a moment without fear in his life. For the first time in his life, he experienced that moment on Pavo. Laurel reports to Cole about the technology being used on the Discovery, and Cole is very unimpressed. Laurel attempts to leave, but she's stopped. Cole believes her skills as an interrogator can still be of use, and he allows her to stay if she pledges allegiance to Cole in his house. She does so, and he smears some red paint on her face, or maybe that's paint. These are Klingons, after all. Cole then reveals that he knows she was lying and orders the guards to take her away. The Klingons then receive an invitation from the planet Pavo. Tyler and Burnham arrive back on the bridge of the Discovery. Pavo is now transmitting an electromagnetic signal on two specific subspace bands. The Pavans are trying to bring the Klingons and the Federation together to work out their differences and create harmony. The Ship of the Dead is on their way, and the USS Discovery is Pavo's only defense. You know, Bill, I might have to work on my Latin a little bit, but you certainly do not. I never get tired of those mellifluous tones telling us about the episode in such great detail. Very well done, sir, as always. Thank you. I, I admit that I learned all my Latin from Google. So there, there you have it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll have to check out that Google thing. I'm sure you guys are saying it wrong. Like when I read it, I thought it said, see Miss Pac-Man's mozzarella. <laughs> I think that that's probably close enough to how I was saying it. I, I'll okay, buy it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, guys, there's a lot to digest in this week's episode, so let's get right into it. Um, the first thing that I I really was interested in is it is obvious to me that Starfleet has a huge disadvantage with the Klingons right now. It was evident from the first battle scene that we saw. They may have the spore drive. But the Klingons have those cloaking devices. Uh, Bichet, what are your thoughts on what we saw with that opening battle? Well, it's interesting to watch this because I was under the impression that the only ship that had it was the sarcophagus ship that had the cloaking technology. And somehow Mm -hmm. they've really managed to duplicate this technology within a very short period of time and be able to share it within the other Klingon ships. And you're very right in that the Klingons definitely have an advantage with the cloaking technology because, as we heard in the episode, all six ships that they engaged in battle have the cloaking technology, while Discovery is the only ship in the Federation fleet that has the spore drive. 
Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, of course, the Glen is destroyed, so they're the only one. They can't be everywhere at once, no matter how much they try to be. Um, yeah, in regards to the cloaking device, Bill, um, let's see, it's been what? It's It's been seven months, close to a year now by this time that the uh, the war actually started. Are you in line with that they could have gotten that uh, technology to the other ships that have joined uh, the House of Core, so to speak, by this point? I think the thing that amazes me the most is that this means there must be Klingon engineers, and we've never seen a Klingon engineer in the whole of Star Trek in 51 years. <laughs> Good point. I, um, I, I do think that, I, I do think it's possible, you know, because Core, uh, sorry, Cole is motivated, right? I mean, he wants to rule the Klingon Empire. He's not like Takuvma. He's not looking for people to, you know, to sign on to his cause. He wants to rule, you know, with an iron fist. And if this is what brings the other Klingon houses in line, then so be it. I'm sure he'll promise them the moon and the stars and a few Klingon moons um, if it means that, you know, they will they will pledge their allegiance to him and his house. As long as it's not Praxis, I guess uh, that would be a good deal, right? <laughs> I have I've never heard of Praxis. What's that? Oh, okay. All right. Well, one of the things that I thought was very interesting, also uh, in regard, I I did say House of Cole because uh, because I just love the fact that he's from the House of Cole. Of course, uh, of Core rather. Of course, Core. he is Cole. But uh, Cole Core, you know, we we mix them up all the time here, at discovering Trek, or at least I do. Um, let's uh, switch gears a little bit to a, a, an area that I'm greatly concerned with, and that is Lieutenant Stamets. Um, I was just saying not 10 minutes before the show started on Sunday night to my wife that I really love how Stamets has evolved since he started being the prime spore drive driver. Uh, and then he gets out of the spore drive tonight or Sunday night and, oh, he's right back to normal. Or was he? Do you think that was a little flashback to the future when he was calling Tilly captain, Bill? Uh, I don't. I think he was just really disoriented. I think that, you know, for all the developments we've seen with Stamets and the pieces of his personality that we've unlocked, or he's unlocked, I should say, I think that there's a, a terrible cost to him interfacing with this sport drive. I mean, obviously we saw it with the tardigrade. It clearly did not treat that life form well. And there's no way it could possibly be treating Stamets well. I think that... Uh, this coming week, there, there's going to be, uh, I think there's going to be a problem. I think he's going to have a very serious issue, and there could be a very serious choice for him to make. But I, I think this is literally just an after effect of, of you know, riding the, the wave of the mycelial network of sorts. Brandon, do you think that he's aware that these things are happening to him in a way that is concerning to him, or is he just trying to hide it by turning into his usual? gruff self that we saw with Tilly and then later on in the cafeteria with Tilly as well. I think he's fully aware of what's going on. And uh, per what you said just a few uh, seconds ago there, I really do believe that he, he he's talked about being outside of the timeline. I I really do believe that he's seen the future and seen Tilly as a captain uh, because, and the only reason why is because of that scene that we got in episode three, where Tilly says firmly, I'm going to be a captain someday. And, you know, at that time, it was given to us as just kind of a little bit of a tidbit into Tilly's character. But that's a direct callback to that line by calling Tilly the captain. So I think he's somehow going out of time and he's definitely realizing that something's wrong. And, you know, one of the things with Stamets uh, being in control of the spore drive now that I haven't really liked hearing people say is they're, they're, they're describing it as he's being high, like especially in the last episode, oh, he's riding the mushrooms, he's doing the mushrooms and he's mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. And I don't like that because I don't think it has anything to do with mushrooms. To me, it's clearly because of the tardigrade DNA that's made these changes in him. And then it's, exponential growth is because he's putting himself through these spore drives, these jumps. Now, the thing about the jumps is I think it's easier for him to understand than the tardigrade. And we've seen it in Star Trek before because we're, we're conscious and we're aware and we're human beings kind of like the, uh, the, it, it makes me think of the climax to the enemy within where, you know, the dog couldn't handle the transporter joining because he's just a dog. 
but Kirk could handle it because he's a man and he can reason what's going on. So that's my interpretation of Stamets going through the spore drive is because he's a man and able to reason and the tardigrade is you know, while science fiction that it's this large, it is just a larger representation of like this small organism that simply reacts. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. I actually, I love that explanation. I think that's very cool. Let me ask you both a question in regards to Stamets. Let's pretend for a second. Well, let me stop. Let me go back. I've seen a lot of things uh, today, especially the day after the episode aired um, about Stamets and the mirror universe and Stamets from the mirror universe. And he's switching back and forth. And that's why we're seeing these mood changes. Let's pause for a second and let's pretend that Jonathan Frakes never said anything about the mirror universe a couple of months ago when he mentioned it, that the mirror universe was going to be involved here. Do either one of you take any, um, any solace or, or do you believe in any way, shape or form that it could be Stamets bouncing back and forth from the mirror universe? Bill, I'm going to ask you first. I personally don't. I don't think there's any way that he could just be bouncing back and forth and then being able to just act however he's acting without some kind of, of oddness being, being seen by the crew in addition to what we see with his behavioral change. What do you think? I don't think he's bouncing back and forth. You know, a, a few weeks ago when, in the prediction segment, the long-range scans, you know, I, I made the prediction that I, I think that the Stamets that we wound up with is mirror Stamets. And I think that's, for me, I think that's been proven untrue. Um, I, I think that, you know, at, at some point we will see a mirror episode with this cast and, and this ship. But I think that we're all anticipating it so much that we just want to believe that that every possible thing, oh, oh, that could be mirror, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's this or people thinking the entire show is set in the mirror universe. Uh, um, spoiler alert, it's not. Um, <laughs> so um, that that's kind of where I am on it. It's funny because uh, Brandon, I'll get to your your um, thoughts on that in a second. I, I love the idea of knowing that there's going to be a mirror universe involved, but you're absolutely right, Bill. Now that it's been teased to us, we're all thinking it at, at various points. Oh, this has got to be mirror. That's a, that's a great, great point. Uh, Brandon, what do you think? Um, are you looking forward to the mirror universe version? Do you think that anything that we're seeing right now has anything to do with the mirror universe? Uh, myself, I don't think that anything that we're seeing right now has anything to do with it. I think people would have tried to come to that conclusion on their own because of that one shot that we had with Stamets in the bathroom, right? Where we saw his reflection paused. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've gone back to think about that scene now that we see, now that we've seen like the last episode with mud and the, and the temporal anomaly and the re the reoccurring time, uh, 30 minute time frame there. And I'm trying to comprehend in my head how that fits, but I think people still would have come up with, Hey, I think this is a mirror universe myself. I don't think anything we've seen has anything to do with the mirror universe yet. So, and while I do anticipate it because I am also am a fan of the mirror universe, I'm not seeing anything here that indicates it. Okay, good. I think we're all in agreement then. So let's move on to uh, another aspect of, of Sunday night show. And that is Laurel. Uh, wow. This was a great Laurel episode. Mary Chifo just did such a great job. Laurel is walking a very, very dangerous line right now. And Brandon, uh, what were your thoughts on what we saw with her, uh, with the Admiral? I kept waiting and kept waiting for the other shoe to drop because I didn't buy for a second that she was being honest with the Admiral. Now, I don't believe that she wants to serve Cole and I even from the beginning, but I also don't believe that she wants to defect. Now I know that the fan theory out there is that Tyler is Vuk. I don't necessarily think that that's the case myself, but uh, I, I don't think that Laurel wants to defect. And I was very confused with this episode because right up to the end there, where she's like, you know, I you weren't what I expected, and then she kills her. And honestly, like I believe that the admiral's dead. Right, because there's no indication given that she could be coming back. So I, I like the storyline a lot because it kept me guessing, and I'm still guessing. Wow. Okay. Well, um, that'll be that. You just an- you just answered a question that I was going to ask. So, Bill, do you think that Cornwell is dead after what we saw last night? 
I, I don't. I, I think she's still alive because I thought that we had uh, we just one too many lingering shots on her. Um, I, I think for some reason, I think we're going to see Cornwell again if, alive. I, I could be wrong, but it just uh, something about that fight just didn't really ring true to me. I don't think that Laurel wants an effect. I think that, that Brandon's right about that. I think that that really was just a tool for her to get information about discovery or to at least find a way to get close to it. So maybe they can capture it. And like they said, maybe Cole can use that technology throughout the empire. Um, but I just, I, I got a feeling, I don't know what it is, but I'm not convinced that, uh, that Kat Cornwell is, uh, has, has clocked out as it were. <laughs> um, I am with, I am with uh, you and Brandon in regards to her not really wanting to defect, but I'm going to side with Bill on this one, Bichet, because I don't think she's dead either. And watching after Trek last night, after the episode, I kind of don't think she's dead based on a couple of things that I think she let slip. Very subtly, but um, I thought the fight was really great. I thought it was choreographed just fantastically. And I got to say that those two actresses do a great job together. Every scene that they shared last night was very, very well done. Um, as I said, Laurel's walking a dangerous line, and we certainly saw that she didn't pull any Klingon wool over uh, Cole's eyes because he saw right through the deception. And I'm a little worried as to what she's going to be going through next uh, when she was being dragged away by the guards. So we shall see. Guys, I wanted to keep the best for last, in my opinion. Um, we knew going into this week that it was going to be a very Saru heavy episode. Mm -hmm. And it certainly did not disappoint. I thought that Saru, um, we saw a lot of his character this week that we have been waiting for for a long time. And it was done in an unfortunate way, in my opinion. It was really too bad that we only get to see it because he was, quote, I don't know if manipulated is the right word. But what did you think, uh, Brandon, in regards to this transformation that we saw with Saru, were you happy that this was happening to him and he finally got to, to feel that peace that he has never had in his life? Or were you upset in the way that it happened and that he, it shouldn't be that way? I really like the Saru storyline here. And in my opinion, what I was watching here was not, I don't think he was affected in any way by this blue mist. I think that what we saw was Saru, basically in a nutshell, finding a peaceful race that he can live with, that he has been searching for this peace his whole life. And it's something that he just, he can't fathom giving up now that he's found something like this. And it's, it's not that it's something that infested him and infected him. It's just that he's like, I can't, he, once he was communicating with him, he's like, I can't believe there's a race like this. I'm always afraid wherever I am, I'm scared. I'm afraid everywhere I go. And this is the only planet I've ever been to where I'm not afraid of anything. And so he just doesn't want to leave that and he doesn't want to risk leaving that. And that's why he took the actions that he did is that he's, he's afraid of losing this peace that he's experienced for the first time in his life. And I think that's a really fascinating plot development for this character because it just shows him like we can't really comprehend living our lives in fear constantly. And that's really what Saru is about. He's constantly afraid of something. So to be going to this planet where there's no fear must be just freeing and liberating for him. Excellent insight into that, man. I really like uh, I really like that take. Hey, Bill, what about you? Uh, I've always said Saru is one of my favorite characters, and we got to see some things from him that we didn't expect this week. Uh, what was your take on what happened to him? You know, I think that, that Brandon brought up a lot of great points. You know, I, I think that, you know, like him, I think the disorienting thing for Saru was the lack of fear. I mean, you know, he's part of a prey species. You know, he, he called out uh, the term apex predator a couple of times. Um, there are references to that in in in, uh, in David Mack's novel and and about his uh, his history as a as a prey species. But you know, I, I think that the most telling thing was the last scene with Burnham and Sickbay, where he says, you know, he was himself. You know that that is who Saru is, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But I think that um, it wasn't so much that he was under influence, but the thing he was compromised the most by was. Um, being serene. And I think that's really kind of interesting. 
very very interesting. I was I really felt I felt so miserable and bad uh, for Saru, especially when they beamed back up to the ship and he was just crumpled on the floor, and you could see that he was crying and that uh, he was torn. But then later on in sick bay, he, sick bay, he realized um, what he had done and how wrong he was, and and I really think that that moment between Saru and Burnham is going to bring their relationship to another level. It's been so up and down as we've seen through these first seven episodes. And last night's episode, I think, is really going to add a very, very interesting layer uh, to the two of them. Be great to see what happens. Well, here we are, folks. We are at the somber part of the show. This is where we remember those we lost in tonight's episode. We like to call it the Red Shirt Roll Call. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. He's dead, Jim. Discovery is a Star Trek show where we're going to lose crew and we're going to lose characters. That much is certain. And Bill, this week was no different. Uh, who can we say goodbye to this week, partner? Well, Dan, it was a big week for the Red Shirt Roll Call. Sadly, we lost the entire crew, the USS Gagarin, the very open of the episode. They were being attacked by six different Klingon vessels, and unfortunately, they weren't able to withstand the barrage. And of course, Dan, um, we also have to say goodbye to several of Laurel's Klingon compatriots who were pretty much just piled up in a room on the floor, not exactly a fitting end. But then, you know, the Klingon body is it's just a shell. They're going to do with it as they please. Um, and these guys clearly were no friends of Cole. But, uh, Dan, they, they kind of make up the whole of the red shirt roll call. That's a whole lot of people. That is a lot of people. A whole starship. 462 men and women. And uh, Klingons who did certainly did not follow the ways of Cole. All gone. War is hell. So let us raise a glass of Synthahol in their honor as they join the honored dead in this week's red shirt roll call. This week's episode is brought to you by Fansets, the exclusive sponsor for Discovering Trek. You know, Fansets has really so many amazing collectible pin offerings. We are Star Trek fans. We love Star Trek. They have uh, just a, a metric ton of Star Trek pins. And every time we turn around, they are adding brand new characters and ship pins every single day. In fact, you know, they have so many other franchises, whether it's Harry Potter or Marvel Comics or DC or, uh, or even Firefly. They've got just the pin for all of your favorite characters. We want everyone to head on over to fansets.com. Please check out their incredible array of products and accessories. Plus, don't forget, we have an exclusive offer for Discovering Trek listeners. Just enter the discount code STELLA, that's S-T-E-L-L-A, at checkout for 10% off your entire order. As we mentioned last week, due to the storm in the Northeast that caused the delay for our podcast, we're going to stick with this code this week until Sunday, November 12th, 2017, at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Ah, yes. Sweet, sweet Stella. I love it. You know, I actually used that code word last week to order my Series 2 set of pins, and you should all use it now as well, because Series 3 is now available. So take advantage of that savings, folks. Uh, Fansets is constantly releasing new pins, as Bill mentioned, and it's a great way to save money and also add to your awesome collection. You know, Dan, another way to add to your awesome collection is for everyone to sign up for Fansets' brand new episode pin collection. Absolutely. That new Star Trek Discovery episode pin collection is a very unique way to show your love for the latest Star Trek saga. Uh, this collection consists of a unique pin for each of the 15 episodes of Discovery's first season, plus that special season pass pin, which we've been talking about. Uh, it's available for you to order right now at episodepins.com. So head on over there to that site and sign up for the collection before midnight on November 17th, 2017. Orders after November 17th will still receive those 15 episodic pins, but you will not get that really cool season pass pin. So do it now. 
So as Dan mentioned, you need to go over to episodepins.com and place your order. Then about four to six weeks after the ninth episode airs, the first eight episode pins in the series will go out to subscribers along with that special season pass holder pin that Dan mentioned. Then four to six weeks after the last episode of Discovery's first season airs in 2018, the remaining seven pins will ship out to everybody. Fan sets, a set for every fan and a fan for every set. See their entire line at fansets.com, and as always, we thank our friends at Fansets for being our exclusive sponsor for the entire season of Discovering Trek. You know, Trek has always been a reflection of our times, and in this segment of Sensor Analysis, we like to take a look at what this episode helps us discover about our humanity, or perhaps even what it tells us about ourselves. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most human. Brandon, you're our guest tonight. Why don't you go ahead and kick us off with sensor analysis and, and tell us your thoughts on, uh, on what you thought this particular episode showed us about our own humanity. Well, the storyline for Saru really, really resonated with me this episode. And what I got out of it was fear of loss and how the fear of loss can make people afraid of other people and it makes them angry and they can lash out at people. And that's what I saw with Saru this week. And in my, in my opinion, what I see is it's almost like a, a parallel of what happens with the way people treat other races and religions and immigrants coming into our countries. You know, they're almost afraid of losing something. And so they lash out in anger at people with their words or their actions because they're, they've got their own lack of self-confidence. And, and it, it's a fearful thing. It's a scary thing to not know your place in the world. And I don't know, that's, that's, that's what I see. I don't know if it makes a, a lot of sense, but that's the story that I get out of Saru. And, you know, it, it makes me think of that. I don't know if you ever saw that, uh, that comic that was going around. It was a uh, Schrodinger's immigrant and, you know, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's immigrant is the immigrant who they're, they're taking all of our jobs, yet they're, they're lazy and taking all of our services because they're not working and taking all their services for free. And that's those kinds of fears and those kind of hatred were the things that I was thinking about when Saru lashed out at Berman, Burnham and says, you're not going to take this away from me. Right on point, my friend. Very, very well said. Bill, um, I always love to hear what you have to say in this segment. Uh, what have you to share with us? You know, I have to start off a little bit by by talking about my general reaction to the episode because it ties in directly to what I think this episode tells me. And I, I have to say, this is a hard episode for me to watch. It, it's not that I don't enjoy it, because I did on some level, but it's... Well, I, before in Discovering Trek, we've talked about how Star Trek has always been a, a a mirror for humanity. And sometimes we look in that mirror and we don't necessarily like the reflection that looks back at us. Because maybe it hits too close to home or maybe it's a, a part of ourselves that we don't like seeing. And I think for me personally, this episode kind of brought that to light. I think that that, that was true, especially in my own experience. Last week on this podcast, I, I talked about uh, my anxiety and 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 my my very personal struggle with it. And I think that well, I thought that that episode um, taught me what I needed to know about that journey. And then this episode happened, <laughs> and it taught me even more. You know, as part of my own discovery of of, of myself and. And the things that I'm learning about my struggle with anxiety is that um, more often than not, it is fear of fear. You know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy to some degree. And I'm not saying that's the case with Saru, but the way he lashed out at Burnham, especially when she was trying to hook up the communications equipment to the, you know, the uh, the transmitting spire on the uh, on the Pov and Homeworld, I I was just overwhelmed with with how angry he was as the result of his fear. You know, I, I've I've experienced anxiety that is that has made me shut myself in. I've experienced anxiety that is has made me fear for for my life in a situation where I was in no danger. I've experienced anxiety that, you know, um, 
it seems like I, I would never come down from. And for Saru to say that, you know, he finally felt this lack of fear. For me, it was both a, an understanding and, and, and a regret of sorts because it, it, I know what it takes for that to happen for me. So I can only imagine what it takes for a prey species. So I suppose that in this episode, I learn, I learn that my, my anxiety is something that will follow me for, for some time. And it's how I react to it that matters the most. Saru chose a, a way that, um, that, that, you know, involved getting into a fight with Burnham and, and potentially, you know, hurting or maybe doing worse to her. And certainly that's an extreme case, but it, it reminds me that for me myself, I have to be cognizant and mindful of my own actions because they impact other people. Uh, I think for next week, I will want to make sure that I do my segment on humanity first <laughs> because I can't top you, man. That was that was really something. Wow. I mean, that's two weeks in a row. That's I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is just amazing stuff. So very well said, man. I, I find it funny that both of you chose Saru because I was initially going to talk about Saru for my piece, uh, sensor analysis. But I decided to focus on Lieutenant Tyler instead. Um, he was in a Klingon prison for seven months, being tortured for seven months, and he's endured a lot. I'm concerned for him because more often now, we as humans always seem to want revenge in one way or another for the bad things that happen to us. Um, it was a little disturbing for me to listen to him talk to Saru about what he wanted to do to the Klingons and how much he wanted to hurt them. Shortly after talking to Michael about how he wanted to go spend time on Lake Shasta at a camp and, and fish for trout and go sailing and, and, and all those fun, relaxing things. Two very different things, pulling him in opposite directions in a very short amount of time with those two conversations. You know, I, I would I'd be willing to bet that in today's world, we have people with similar hopes and desires. Uh, and it's unfortunate that a lot of the time, especially recently with all the things that we see happening on a daily basis, we're seeing the revenge and the hurt is winning out. So here's hoping that Ash doesn't fall into that same deep, dark chasm that far too many people in present day seem to be falling into. All right, boys, it's time for Starfleet Commendations. And as you know, this is where we pick a couple of things that we want to specifically call out in the episode. Uh, could be characters, performances, or scenes, whatever you want. So, uh, Biche, my man, let's start with you. What do you have for commendations this week? Well, I've got I've got a couple here, but two of them kind of go together here. One of my favorite shots in the entirety of Star Trek history is actually in the cage when they all beam down to Talos Four, and Spock goes up to those plants and the shimmering plants, and he touches them and smiles. And the sound of that shimmering plant is almost like the transporter sound, right? And we got that in this episode and we got the blue plants in this episode and I loved it so, so much to have that tiny little callback to something that's so important for me in Star Trek. That is honestly one of my favorite shots in all of Star Trek from the cage. So I just, I absolutely love that. So whoever came up with that, bravo. Thank you so much. And thank you for making the plants blue. I love it because, again, it calls back to those shimmering plants on Talos 4. I love it. Uh, yeah, I, I've always loved the Spock smile as well. That's something that I've always liked because you don't really see that that often unless he's under some uh, spore. Oh, look at that. Hey, uh, what else you got? Anything else? Or, uh, or is that was that the only one for this week? Uh, those are the main ones, but also, you know, these these aliens, what were they called? The the pa, The Pobbins. The Paw Wraiths? <laughs> nice <laughs> the pavins yes so with the pavins you know again here we've got this tos trope of these shimmering light beings you know like you know it, it calls back to so many episodes like Aaron of mercy you know and uh what's the one with the klingons the day of the dove you know all these shimmering light beings so another wonderful thing that i just want to call out and and, and bravo again for that for these cool little thing that's such a trope for the original series i love it Nice. Very, very well, 
Well, that's some good call-outs, man. I love combinations. I think this is one of my favorite parts of the entire show. Uh, Bill, uh, God, I should probably go first because you're going to probably blow me away. But we'll stay with you. What do you got for the commendations this week, buddy? Well, you know, um, I've only got a couple this week. Um, first up, I have to I have to give Doug Jones a commendation. He is fantastic in this episode. He adds so much depth and layer to Saru and just such raw emotion. And it's it's a joy to see. You know, I've said for a while that that really um, this isn't really about Saru being the substitute for Spock or Data. Really, Burnham is. But Saru really gets a chance to stand out and shine. So does Doug Jones. So he's he's the first one. The second one has to go to Kirsten Beyer, the um, the writer, uh, the Star Trek novelist who who penned this script this week. I love it because it has a pure TOS vibe. Um, it, it's it, it's like it, it could have been ripped straight from the original series, but yet has a little bit of next gen in there. Has a little bit of some of the other shows. I like that it's a script that that makes you think, and that actually gives a, a Saru a, a real challenge. I, I think that the only thing I wish is that this episode might have been fifteen to twenty minutes longer because I think it needed it. I, I do think that um, uh, there's so much more that could have been told. But uh, I, I love what she did. So those are my two commendations this week, Dan. Nice. I like it. And, you know, I do agree with you. There was so much going on in this week's episode. They were It was packed full of stuff. So sometimes it was a little hard to digest everything because there was so much going on. Uh, my commendations this week, I got to give a very special shout out to Mary Chifo and Jane Brooke for their scenes together on the Klingon ship. They... I said it earlier, they do a magnificent job together. The fight scene was very well choreographed. Um, they seem to uh, play off each other very, very well. And it was it was really good to see the two of them uh, together. And I hope we get to see more of it. I Like I said, I don't think she, the Admiral's dead um, because I want to see more of them together, whether it's uh, uh, fake on Laurel's part or not. It was, it was great to see them. Uh, my second commendation, I'm going to point out, uh, the special effects team over at Discovery, you know, from that space battle at the very beginning of the episode to the transceiver on Pavo and the Pavans themselves. I mean, just, just wow. We've seen cinematic special effects from the Discovery team since the first shot of Discovery in episode one. And they just keep upping their game. And uh, I look forward to seeing what they do every single week. They are geniuses. But my biggest commendation for this week has to go to Doug Donkey Kick Jones himself. Um, I love Saru. I love what we're seeing. I don't think anybody other than Mr. Jones could pull off what we're seeing with this character. He is so great uh, as Saru. I love this guy as an actor. uh, And I can't wait to see what else we have. You know what I really want to see, guys, is I want to see the predator race that the Kelpians of Saru's uh, upbringing are so afraid of because they got to be pretty bad because Saru's fast and he's strong. Um, But uh, Doug Jones, awesome job as always. So as we look into our long-range scanners, gentlemen, uh, we want to get your predictions for next week's episode nine, which will be the finale before the winter break of Star Trek Discovery. So, Bill, I'm going to start with you, sir. Uh, What do you think we are going to see next week uh, in this big episode? Well, you know, big really is the best way to describe it. Judging from the preview um, at the end of this week's episode, uh, if we thought there was a lot going on this week, I can only imagine what's going to happen next week. And um, I got to admit, I don't know what's going to happen, but I will tell you this. I think there's going to be a cliffhanger Um, of epic proportion, maybe the likes we haven't seen since The Best of Both Worlds, part one. That's my prediction. I think it's going to be a long winter break. Wow. Those are big words, my friend. (laughs) Okay. Brandon, uh, can you top that one, man? Well, I I think it's really interesting because this was originally supposed to be the cliffhanger, and I think it would have worked as a cliffhanger. So what are we going to see next week? I'm not quite sure, but with them moving an episode up, I'm almost wondering if, I'm kind of hoping we get a reveal of Voke 
himself and what he's been up to on the Klingon home, or not the Klingon homework, but with the matriarchs, because I still, I don't think anymore that uh, Tyler is Voke. So that's what I'm hoping to see. And maybe that's how the episode's going to end. Wow. Okay. Well, mine's not as big as you guys are, so I'm just going to just say uh, we haven't had <laughs> a significant death uh, in several weeks. Of course, we did lose a whole starship this week, but I mean character deaths. I was completely wrong with my prediction last week that the Admiral will be killed and that Lorca would have a part in it. So for next week, prediction, pain. Little Rocky reference there. Someone's going to be leaving us next week, and uh, it's not going to be a, a very pleasant death. That's my prediction, and I kind of like the idea of a cliffhanger too. Yeah. You know, Dan, Halloween may be over, but we still have a treat to give away, don't we? Oh yes, we certainly do, Bill. As mentioned last week, we're giving away five of the creepiest aliens in the fan set Star Trek library, and they include the Salt Vampire, the Magatu, the Gorn, go ahead, Bill, a Jem'Hadar soldier, and a Borg drone. All week, listeners have been retweeting our latest episode on their own Twitter pages, and now it's time to pick a winner. First of all, thank you so much to everyone for taking part in the contest. It's a great way to win some great stuff, but it's also a great way to tell all your Twitter friends about the podcast, and we truly appreciate it. So without any further ado, Dan, uh, drum roll, please. Wow. Hey, an actual drum roll. Fantastic. You're welcome. Well, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, congrats to Dilithium Crystal. And on Twitter, that's at, and I hope I'm saying this right, Crystal Pisano, P I S A N O. You have won this special set of fan sets pins, and we swear you're going to love them. Send us a direct message on Twitter at the Discovering Trek Twitter page, and we'll get your information and we'll send the pins right out to you. And Dan, speaking of pins, we have a pretty awesome, and as you called it, an epic giveaway coming up. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, Epic is truly, truly a good description of what we have coming up. So we're going to be wrapping up the first half of the season here in just another week. Uh, And you've all listened to Bill and I talk all this time about what we think of Discovery so far. Well, you know what? Now we want to hear from you, and we're going to have you all be a part of an upcoming episode of Discovering Trek. So what we want you to do is call us at 508-784-1701 or go online at speakpipe.com slash trekgeeks and leave us a voicemail about your thoughts on the first half of the season of Star Trek Discovery. It's just that simple. Tell us your favorite moment from the first nine episodes because we want to hear it. We're going to take all of your messages and we're going to put them into an episode of the podcast during Discovery's winter break. And here's the coolest part. We're going to pick three winners at random from all of these submissions. Third place will receive a USS, USSS, that was good, USS Discovery and a USS Shenzhou pin. Second place will receive a Series 3 set of Discovery pins, which will include the Klingon sarcophagus ship, Laurel, Dr. Culber, Ash Tyler, and Cole. Wow. And uh, Bill, I think you've got some good info on what the grand prize is going to be. Dan, this is this is really exciting. Our grand prize winner is going to win the first eight pins from the Fansets episode pin collection. I I'm stunned. This is really an amazing giveaway, and we we cannot thank Fansets enough for supplying all of these awesome pins as prizes for our listeners. So as Dan mentioned, call us at 508-784-1701, or you can go to speakpipe.com slash trekgeeks between now and Sunday, December 10th, 2017, and leave a message on your thoughts about Discovery and, and maybe your favorite moments, and you could be taking home some awesome fan set pins just in time for the holidays. That is just so awesome. And again, as always, we want to thank fan sets for all that they do for us here at Discovering Trek. So, Bill, uh, next week, mid-season finale, my man, what do we got going on on this here podcast? Well, Dan, next time on Discovering Trek, we're going to take a look at Star Trek Discovery's ninth episode, 
the mid-season finale titled Into the Forest I Go. And Dan, joining us to break down the episode will be none other than Ashley Victoria Robinson and Jason Inman from the Geek History Lesson podcast. In the meantime, remember that you too can subscribe to Discovering Trek by searching for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, or by heading on over to discoveringtrek.com. And for those of you listening on iTunes and Apple Podcasts, we truly would appreciate if you'd rate and review the podcast. That will help other Star Trek fans find the show. Dan? Excellent. Well, Brandon, as always, it was great to have you join us here to talk some Trek. Um, It's always a pleasure to have you on, whether it's here on Discovering Trek or over on Trek Geeks. Um, And we look forward to having you on again in the future. Until then, though... Uh, where can people find you on all that social media internet type stuff? Well, when I'm not trying to be one with the blue smoke, you can find me over on Trek FM with Warp 5, which is our Star Trek Enterprise podcast, which I co-host with my friend Floyd Dorsey. And it's a lot of fun over there. We do a lot of interviews with different uh Star Trek Enterprise celebrities, uh, and we're going through our season three retrospective right now. And you can also find me on The Edge, which is Star Trek's, uh, which is Trek FM's Star Trek Discovery podcast. And I have my co hosts of Amy Nelson and Mike Schindler on that show. And you can also find me over on the Fandom Podcast Network, having a lot of fun with my friends Chris and Tom, where we have Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast which is all about the films of Alfred Hitchcock, and we're going through his films one at a time, and we're currently in his early silent works. And I just want to thank you guys very much uh, for having me on Discovering Trek. It's been a lot of fun, and I really do love listening to your show. And I want to send a big thank you as well to Kirsten Beyer for her work on this episode that we've covered tonight because it's great to get somebody who's involved in the literary universe involved with television because these people are really truly fans and they know their canon and they know the deep minutiae of Star Trek and it's really starting to show uh, with the episodes that we're getting on Star Trek Discovery. So thanks again very much, gentlemen. I really, really appreciate being brought on your show right now. It's a great honor and privilege. Keep up the great work. Well, we thank you for for taking the time to sit with us and talk some Star Trek Discovery, man. We really appreciate it. Well, that's it for Episode 8, folks. So until next episode, here are some words of wisdom from Dr. Roger Corby from the classic TOS episode, What Are Little Girls Made Of? Can you imagine how life could be improved if we could do away with jealousy, greed, and hate? And until next week, never stop discovering. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing one song for each episode of the original Star Trek. Download their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek, a Star Trek Discovery Companion, is a production of Trek Geeks. Executive producer Dan Davidson. For even more Star Trek discussion, check out the Trek Geeks podcast, available on Apple Podcasts and trekgeeks.com. 